In this video, we're going to look at an application of hybrid orbitals of sigma and pi bonds and delocalization of pi electrons and how it all works with the catalysis of ozone depletion. So kind of taking a look here, first we need to look at, well, what is our ozone layer? So our ozone layer is shown in this picture here. It's a region in the stratosphere where there's a higher concentration of ozone. So ozone, if you recall, is O3. And about 90% of the ozone in the atmosphere is found within this ozone layer. Now, the other thing we need is um, that our sun gives off UV light or UV energy. And there are actually kind of three ways that we can divvy up this UV light that comes from the sun. Um, and that's divvied up into UVA, UVB, and UVC rays. And each one has uh, a specific wavelength or um, energy that is related to it. UVC rays are actually our highest energy rays. So they are our highest energy, and um, they are about 280 nanometers and less, okay? For UVB rays, they're our next highest energy. Uh, they have wavelengths in around the 280 to 320 nanometer range. And then our UV rays, A rays, are our lowest energy. So they are our lowest energy, and they are anywhere from about 320 to 400 nanometers uh, wavelengths. And so the UV radiation from the sun is absorbed by molecules, um, molecules such as O2 and O3, um, as they undergo dissociation. So we need to take a look at how this dissociation works, what it all means for the ozone layer and how it all fits into everything we've learned so far about hybridization and uh, sigma and pi bonds and delocalization of pi electrons. Let's first take a look at oxygen. And I think what we need to recall here is oxygen, in terms of its Lewis structure, has a double bond. Okay, so this double bond requires a good amount of energy, pretty high energy in order to break it. And um, so in order for this reaction here to happen, the O2 reacting to give or dissociating that oxygen into oxygen dot, which is a free radical. This actually means that the oxygen has an unpaired electron um, left over. Um, so that's what the dot's sort of indicating. Um, this requires really high energy. Um, and so it'll absorb really high energy UV radiation. Um, and only from UVC rays that have wavelengths that are even shorter than about 242 uh, nanometers. So if a ray has a wavelength shorter than that, it's going to provide enough energy to break this bond and create these free radicals. Now, ozone, on the other hand, if we take a look at its structure, we could draw a double bond on one side and a single bond on the other side. And so we can have resonant structures for ozone. So because we can have resonance structures, this actually has delocalization. Hopefully I spelled that right. You can let me know uh, in the comments if I did not spell that right. And it kind of went off the page, but that's okay. Um, there are delocalizations, uh, delocalized pi electrons in this structure. And so the bonds here, we don't have just a double bond and a single bond but we have bonds that are in between a single and a double bond. We would say that it has a bond order of about 1.5, just to kind of indicate it's between a single and a double bond. So in order to dissociate 
ozone, breaking it down into an oxygen free radical and an oxygen molecule, it's actually going to take less energy because that uh, those bonds, those delocalized bonds that are between a single and a double bond length are a little bit weaker than a double bond. So it requires less energy to dissociate this. So that means that we can, uh, ozone's going to um, dissociate with lower wavelengths um, and lower energy. And if we look at sort of where that dissociates, um, anything up to about 330 30 nanometers is going to be enough energy to break that bond. So significantly different from oxygen. So going back to our diagram and looking at our ozone layer, like what does this have to do with the, uh, the UV rays coming in from the sun? Well, Ozone is really good at absorbing uh, some of the lower energy UVB radiation as well as some of the UVC radiation. So most of that is not reaching the earth uh, from the sun because it's being uh, partially absorbed by the ozone layer here as well as the oxygen in the atmosphere here is... Um, is being absorbed by most of the oxygen in the upper parts of that atmosphere. So really what's reaching the earth is a little bit of the UVB rays, uh, but mostly it's UVA, which is good news for us because the UVA is the lowest energy and so it's the least likely to do damage to our skin. Now the real problem here is when we have pollutants like CFCs or nitrogen oxides in our environment, they can do a lot of damage to our ozone layer. So let's kind of take a look and see, well, how does it do damage and, and why is it so detrimental to have these in our environment? Uh, so if we start with CFCs, CFCs are chlorofluorocarbons. And chlorofluorocarbons in our atmosphere um, can also absorb some of this UV light from the sun and get broken down into a couple of free radicals. It's the chlorine free radical that really does the damage here. So chlorine free radicals can react with ozone, um, it breaks it down and creates this CLO free radical and oxygen. And then this CLO free radical will react with another oxygen free radical. And that's going to create oxygen. And then it's going to regenerate this chlorine free radical. So we actually say that that is the catalyst here because it is being used up and then it is being generated. So if we were to kind of take a look at the net reaction between these two, if we were to add them up and get rid of anything that's common between both sides, this is taking ozone and an oxygen free radical and producing oxygen. So essentially what's happening here is that the CFCs are being broken down into chlorine free radicals, which are then breaking down ozone over time into oxygen gas. So it slowly eats away at our ozone layer, which is not good because our ozone layer is providing us protection from some of those higher energy UV rays that are coming down from the sun. There's a very sort of similar kind of mechanism that happens with nitrogen oxides or NOxes. And so if we recall, nitrogen oxides are formed by various different pollutants. Um, they can be formed at high altitudes by aircraft. And um, basically what happens is um, we create this nitrogen oxide free radical that does a lot of damage to our ozone layer. So um, this free radical here 
reacts in a very similar way as the chlorine free radical does in our uh, CFC's example. It's going to create another free radical, which then reacts with an oxygen free radical um, and regenerates this NO free radical. So this kind of keeps going over and over again as well, doing a lot of damage to our ozone layer. Um, if we add the two reactions up together, we have the same overall reaction happening. So that ozone is being broken down into oxygen or it's breaking apart or, or breaking down our ozone layer over time, uh, which is not great. So this kind of begs the question, does it ever stop? Well, the only way to kind of get the, any of these reactions to happen is to have two free radicals randomly collide into one another in order to get rid of the free radicals from then reacting. So you could, for example, have a free radical from the CFCs and a free radical from the nitrogen oxides colliding together to form some really kind of funky different um, kinds of compounds. But that's the only way that this reaction stops is when free radicals collide with one another. So, um, you know, that's it's kind of an overview of how our ozone layer is being depleted by some very nasty pollutants in our environment and why it's really important that we don't pollute our environment because uh, we don't want to break down that ozone layer. That's it for this video. We'll see you in the next one.